Scott Mason is the eldest. I work in his Intel's Israeli site as a principal engineer in our information technology group, where I run research and development projects investigating the interaction between people's behavior and computers. And uh, this exhibit here came out of an almost accidental event about two years ago when I took a sabbatical vacation. So I had a couple of months away from work. And I started looking at what I have in my basement. What I have in my basement is a huge collection of junk because I've been into electronics as a hobbyist since I was a teenager. I was an electronics construction hobbyist and I was a ham radio operator. And the way you do that is you build things. And the way you build things, at least in Israel in those days, is you take apart other older things. So I would get my hands on all sorts of surplus equipment and on all the old radios in my family and I would take them apart and build them back together and keep all the bits and pieces in case I needed them in the future. And uh, when I was on this sabbatical a couple of years ago, I decided to look through my boxes of junk that I had there and I discovered that I have a nice little collection of the history of electronics in the second half of the 20th century, at least. So I thought about it and I decided it's time to do some order in order to make room for more junk. And I decided to take some of it and present it to our fellow employees in the Israeli site as an exhibit that I put in our learning center there. So the original idea was to take a couple of shelves and put some interesting items on them. But by the time our community relations people were through with me, we instead ended up building this exhibit with its uh, rather more amazing showcase that was built for us. And while we were at it, we also developed it into a serious exhibit showing the history of electronics throughout the 20th century. Okay, so some, some people ask me, what's the key message behind this exhibit? And to me personally, the key message is that this technology and the way it's been developing over these past few decades is incredible. It's amazing, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's extremely aesthetic actually. And that's something that people tend to forget, certainly people at Intel that are always working with the technology, forget just how beautiful it is. I mean, you can take a chip and put it under a scanning electron microscope, and you can really sit there and navigate in, inside the chip and see what's in there, and it's incredibly beautiful. Or you can put it under a light microscope or some of the stuff in there, you can just stare at it because it's large enough to look at. And there are very pretty things. And on top of that, there is the fact that they are very amazing. The other thing that's amazing about this that we tend not to really remember at Intel is that producing some of this stuff is just an incredible feat. Sometimes I show a chip, a, a bare silicon chip to somebody outside Intel, and they really, then your eyes go pop. You put 40 million thingies in this postage stamp sized little thing. It's incredible to do that. It's, it's something that you can barely think about. And yet, people at Intel, just don't don't consider it at all in our day-to-day work. We're too busy, we're too close to it. So I guess to me this exhibit is an opportunity for people at Intel at any rate to take a step back and look at the technology they've created, which Intel has played a major role in over the years, and and realize what we've done, what we've done to the technology and what the technology has done to the world we live in. So that maybe is the key message for me. The next thing that happened after we built this collection and put it in our Jerusalem plant is other places in Intel wanted to see it. So we started moving it from place to place in the Intel campuses in Israel. Then we shipped it over to the United States and it's been moving. First it went to Santa Clara, then it went to Folsom in California, then it went here to Oregon, and from here it's going to actually continue to Arizona, New Mexico, and all the way to the East Coast. Okay, now what we have here in the exhibition is, is just the physical manifestations of the technology, of course. So we have the chips and we have all this stuff. But the truth is, there's an impact beyond that, of course, because the, the progress throughout this century has led us to where we are today, where we have things that would be totally unthinkable to, to our parents' generation. For example, take the internet. Take the internet, not in the sense that you can just surf to places, the sense that it creates new ways for people to communicate with each other. But uh, when I was a kid, I was a ham radio operator and I would sit back in Morse code and talk to people in other countries. It was quite a big deal to be able to do that. You needed a license to do that. And today, people can communicate and can interact and can sell stuff to each other, including much of this kind of stuff that today I buy over the internet and eBay. And 
The reason you can do it is because the Internet has enabled it and because people have created all these new modes of establishing trust with each other. And all these things are quite interesting to me actually also in, in the course of my job, which is about social interaction across computers. And none of it would, of course, be possible without all this technological development that we've seen. But one good thing that came out of this is that I found a new hub, because after I set this up for, for Intel, I decided to continue collecting these things, and uh, now I'm proactively going after them and, and buying them. That's why I go in my travels, I go to antique stores and so on. And of course, there's the internet, which makes it much easier. And so I have a nice little collection at home by now, too. And perhaps the most, uh, well, let's say the item I like most in it is a large mechanical calculator that we didn't put here because it wouldn't fit. It's a large desktop machine that has a crank handle that you can crank to make calculations. And uh, the thing about that calculator is that my dad had it when I was a small kid. When I was really small, he was doing his PhD and he was doing calculations on that machine all night, every night. And it was a noisy machine. It clunked and it whirred and it rang a bell each time you finished the long division. It was beautiful. And when my dad was away, I could sneak in and play with it. It was a lot of fun to play with, actually, because there was a lot of handles to, to move and crank and so on. So when I got into collecting these things, I decided I need one of those machines. Only I didn't know what it was called. And you know, I had a favorite collection of it from my childhood. So I started looking on the internet for information on mechanical calculation. And I discovered that that is an ordinary type pinwheel calculator, which was actually very popular around the first half of the 20th century. And uh, I needed the exact model my dad had, of course. So I waited for maybe half a year, looked on the internet until I found one that was exactly the right model that was up for sale, and I bought it and got shipped to me. And after many adventures, managed to get to me. Then I invited my father and mother to take a look at it. My mother goes in, takes one look at the thing, and says, does it still ring the bell? Apparently, it kept her awake, too. Okay, now let's consider for a moment what this has done to the life of us ordinary people even over the past few decades. Take this book, for instance. This is a table of logarithms. When I was in high school, we were still taught to use those. The idea was instead of doing multiplication, you could do addition. You put pencil and paper using this table of logarithms and get your results. And at that point, my uncle, who's a physicist, gave me a gift of a slide rule like this one. That was great because while all my friends in school were slaving along using those tables to do their computations, I could sit through the same computation with the slide, which is a much more ingenious device actually for those calculations. So we had those for a while, and then all of a sudden we moved to electronic calculators. Because in 1972, the Hewlett Packard Corporation introduced this machine which is the HP 35 calculator, the first scientific calculator in the world. It was mighty expensive, of course. In my class in college, there was only one student who could afford it, and unfortunately it wasn't me. But we all were quite envious of it. it actually, you your calculation and you get your results instantly to eight significant digits. It was pretty incredible. If you think about it, you're walking along using this sort of old technology, and thinking that's the only thing to raise. And suddenly, in comes your friend with something that can do the same work in a tiny fraction of the time and with complete accuracy. So we had those. By the time I got uh, into a position to own one, I bought one of these. In fact, I bought this very one here, which is another Hewlett Packard calculator. It's somewhat smaller. And it was very pleasant to use, it, say, because it fits very nicely in the palm of your hand. I think as a kind of rounded back. It sits very comfortably in your hand. It has those beautiful red digits that some people may still remember, which were completely eradicated by the arrival of these dull gray digits that we have today on calculators. But we have this little calculator there. But in a sense, that was probably the best age for calculators in that time. And of course, today everybody has a different calculator. Nobody thinks about it. But if you start to think about it, those are extremely complicated instruments that you can buy for $10 or less probably these days. That goes to the miracle of this technology. But without the integrated circuit technology that's connected to the Intel and similar companies, making a calculator like one of these would be a massive project that would probably involve tens of thousands of dollars at least. 
Here we have a claim of magnetic core memory. This is basically there are 8,000 bits of information that you can store on this little plane, and each bit consists of a magnetic ring, a ring of magnetic material that you can magnetize one way or the other to signify zero or one. And all those rings are strung in little wires that people actually sat on them by hand probably back then, and a bunch of these things together would form a memory module that you would put in a mainframe computer. Now, the thing that changed all that is the fact that Intel invented in 1970 this little chip you see here, which is the 1103 era. This is the first dynamic graph, which is the first chip of the kind we still use to this very day. Only today, we have chips with millions and millions of bits of memory on them, and this one had just a thousand bits of memory, which is still much more dense than what we have in those magnetic memories. And this is the invention that made the great for Intel and got it to basically conquer a market share and throw out the old technology that was used until then. And what you see here on this big board is 24K bytes, 24,000 bytes of memory using chips of the same kind as this uh, Intel chip. Somebody sat actually and wired them together by hand. If you look at the back of the board, it's all wire wrapped. It's all small wires connected from pin to pin on all these chips. And this was just one board out of many such boards that that person did. It was a lot more than the last set sometime in the early 80s when he threw them out. So what you have here is a person that spent probably weeks of hard labor and a lot of money getting what you can get today in a tiny fraction of the tiny memory module that the ones we have over here at the end, which is what we use today. And this chip is one of the three big inventions that characterize it as first few years. The second big invention is the e which is the chip we have in here, which is the erasable, programmable, read-only memory chip that would retain its memory when you turn off the electricity. That was our second big invention. And the third big invention, probably the most important, is this, which is the first microprocessor, the 404 chip, which was a complete central processing unit of a refined computer on a single chip of silicon. This chip contained 2,300 transistors, compared to today's uh, tens of millions of transistors, and it ran at a tenth of a megahertz, compared to today's thousands of megahertz, and it used 4-bit bandwidth compared to today's 32 or 64 bits, but it was the first real microprocessor in the revolution of Now here we have a display of the progress in silicon wafer size. And these silicon wafers are the raw material, basically, that we produce our chips on. Each of these is then cut into little rectangular pieces, and each rectangular piece is a chip, such as a tender processor. And what we see here is how these wafers have grown in size over the life of this industry. So initially, way back when we were using things like one inch and one and a half inch wafers, like the little one down there, and when Intel was founded in 68, they were doing two inch wafers, like the one down here. And then they started growing up. Which is not trivial because each new generation of space requires manufacturing techniques. The silicon vendors have to develop their own techniques to really make pure silicon, single crystals of silicon that are larger and larger without having defects in them. And our industry needs to develop the ability to produce on these wafers, which makes bigger machines and it's complicated. And so we see how we have three inch wafers, that's three inch wafer with microprocessors on it, with four inch wafers. A lot more eye candy than we were doing those. Then we had a very short period of five inch, we moved to six inch wafers, and then we see eight inches in today's standard memory, which is the following. And one thing I can tell you is each time we got a new generation, at the time I was actually in an engineering factory plant. Each time the new wafer site would come, we would, were totally amazed. So I came in on four inch wafers. When six inch wafers showed up, it was like, well, look at the size of that thing. It looked totally wrong being so big. And of course, later we got used to the six inches and then the eight inches coming in and were really amazing to us how we even produce the six inch wafers. And then came the 12 inch wafers and everything else looks tiny in comparison. So that is progress for you, if you will, in that area, like in all these other areas. The whole thing is about how things get 
better, faster, bigger. It should be bigger, smaller. It should be smaller. And they change extremely rapidly, which is what this whole thing is.